Hey, church family, how you doing? Pastor Simpson here, and I wanted to introduce to you uh, the preacher for the hour, uh, the Reverend Damon Fraylin. Uh, we all went to seminary together, and seminary would end on most evenings somewhere around 8.45, 9 o'clock, but some of us would be in the parking lot till 10, 11, maybe a little later than 11, solving all the problems of the world and bonding with each other. And Reverend Fraylin was one of those that used to hang out with us. Uh, Reverend Fraylin is currently the associate pastor at St. John's UMC downtown, a graduate of Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University, a father and a husband, uh, part of a clergy couple. His wife, Danielle, who is also fantastic, serves as associate pastor at First UMC in Houston, Texas. I uh, would like you all to give him a warm welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Damon Fraylin. Good morning, Faith morning. UMC. Um, it's so glad I'm so glad to be here with you today. Uh, as Pastor Johnny said, um, you know, we've known each other for a while. And I just want to say thank you for all the hospitality that you have shown me. Some of you have been so good to come by, even the pastor study and welcome me. And uh, Reverend Walters, you've been so great uh, just welcoming me here today. It's been such a joy. Uh, to be in fellowship and in worship with you today. And for that, I want to thank you. Amen. Amen. You know, I met your pastor uh, in 2011 at Protho Hall in Perkins School of Theology. And soon after, I learned that he was from Indiana, as am I. Uh, and from that point on, a strong kinship began to develop. And I've sat in awe of the tremendous work that he's done over the years uh, with and through you. He has become one of my closest confidants over the years. Whenever I have to make the weighty decisions, I talk with Pastor Johnny. Uh, so I want to take this time to also thank him and thank you for the wonderful work that you're doing. Can we give him a hand clap? And I want to thank him for the opportunity to come and share what the Lord has laid on my heart. As we continue to pray for him and his recovery, um, we know that the surgery was a success, and though now we just, he's convalescing, and we're just looking forward to see how God will continue to heal him and bring him back to you. I also want to thank uh, my senior pastors, Rudy and Juanita Rasmus at St. John UMC, for allowing me the time to get away and come share with you what's on my heart. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like us to get into our text. Um, if you would turn with me to the book of Acts, um, sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles, though uh, if you like me, when you read the Acts of the Apostles, you can almost rename it to the Acts of the Spirit, uh, because the Spirit is so active in that book written by Luke. We'll start reading at verse, at chapter 10. We'll do one through five, and then we'll skip down to verse 44 through 48. And it reads, in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. Now verse 44. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. 
the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Will you pray with me, church? Gracious God, it is by your mercy that we gather, and it is by your grace that we can even worship. And so we pray today that your spirit would have full vent, that your name be exalted, that you are seerly clean, seen clearly, and that you guide us in our time of sacred conversation. It's in the holy name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So uh, at St. John's, once you meet someone, you become family. So if it's okay, I'm going to call you family for a little bit. Is that all right? Amen. Amen. You know, family, so those who really know me know that I can be a bit regimented. I like to do my work at the same coffee shops. When I write, I like being close to a window. At most times when possible, I face east. I get the same drink, small iced coffee, 2% milk, four Splenda. I listen to the same classical music stations. And you know, while these behaviors can seem benign, if I'm not careful, I can become a slave to my own way of doing things. I can get stuck and caught up in my own process. And do you know that being stuck can be a debilitating circumstance? In fact, the biographical drama, The Diving Bell and a Butterfly, it recounts the epicurean and lavish lifestyle of the magazine editor of Elle, France, Jean-Dominique Bobby. It was at age 43 he experienced a tragic stroke that left him in a coma for three weeks. The story opens with Bobby waking up, being treated by Dr. Cochiton at the Naval Hospital at Burt Samer. He couldn't speak, so he was asked to confirm by blinking his eyes. Soon he was visited by his neurologist, Dr. LePage who discloses that Bobby's cerebrovascular accident has irreparably damaged his brain stem, which links the brain to the spinal cord. And though fully conscious, Bobby is paralyzed completely with what is known as locked-in syndrome. Except for some, sign, some small head motion, only he can communicate with his left eyelid. His, his entire body denies his command. He's stuck in his own body. And you know, being stuck can be a hopeless predicament. You know, here in our text, it introduces us to a man named Cornelius in Acts. He's a centurion of the Italian cohort. He's a person of prominence and a leader of 100 men. He feared God with all his household. And you know what? He's trying with all his might to live a pious life. With sincerity, he's trying to do the right things. When he saw someone in need, he didn't ask them what went wrong or what they were going to do with the funds that he gave to them. He gave out of his own pocket what they needed. He paid his tithes. He contributed to the local synagogue building campaign. He strove to live within religious practices of Judaism. He prayed regularly, and he didn't mistreat those who were in his charge. He kept the Sabbath holy. Scripture says that he was well spoken of by all of the Jewish nation. However, as much as he tried to do these things, he was still considered an outsider. He wasn't of Abraham's seed. In fact, he couldn't fully appreciate the full history of Israel. 
What's more, he was a centurion. He held a position of power and prominence in the Roman Empire. And so he was obliged to participate in the official state pagan cult. He stood at the boundary between the polytheistic religious practices of the empire and the monotheism of Israel. He couldn't utter the Shema, a prayer that serves at the centerpiece of Jewish prayer life. Oh, you remember it, it's in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love, the God, you shall love our God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He couldn't share in the promises that God had given to the called out covenant people of Israel. He couldn't claim the Abrahamic covenant where God says, I will establish my covenant to be your God and to your offspring. He couldn't reminisce with the about the ancestral stories like the crossing of the Red Sea, where God told Moses afterward, you saw how I bore you up on eagle's wings and brought you out to myself. Self. And now, if you obey my voice and keep my commandment, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. And you know what? Cornelius was reminded of this daily. In fact, he was reminded of this when he went to synagogue worship. He was never invited for extended stays. Whenever it was time to break bread, he knew he was different. You know, it was because of the ritual laws. You remember it. It was in the holiness code in Leviticus. You couldn't eat certain things because they were deemed unclean. True Jews kept the kosher food laws because it was a manner of survival for the culture and the identity for them. The only problem was that it led many to separate from Israel the people that didn't share in the same faith. In antiquity, to eat with someone was to share spiritually in what they believed. And so by implication, if you ate with Gentiles, many felt you were colluding in idolatrous practices. So many Jews didn't eat at the table with Gentiles because it caused table time issues. And so there is hard work in Cornelius. He's forlorn Cornelius pigeonholed and stuck. He's at a kind of unyielding border, toiling and giving God the best he knows how, but isn't growing any closer to this God. And the Jewish believers refuse to reach out to share the gospel with him. You know, fear and discrimination has kept both the Jews here and Cornelius bound. Have you ever felt forgotten, overlooked, have you ever felt invisible? Continuously slamming your head against a glass ceiling of discrimination that won't even crack. I have. I recall having those painful conversations with God, saying if my prayers, didn't knowing if my prayers were ever getting above my own roof. But you know, discrimination acts that way sometimes, doesn't it? And we shouldn't be surprised, should we? If you look at our history, the United States and its checkered past, when you think of the history of even the Mexican Americans, it's in the mid 1800s when the militarily unprepared Mexico crosses paths with an expansionist minded President James Polk, who believed that the US had a certain manifest destiny to spread across the continent. And so Mexican Americans began their experience in the US, not as immigrants, but as a conquered people. And for numerous years, they fed the country through their farm labor, but reaping very little of its fruit. It's what journalist Edward Murrow would call the harvest of shame. But you know, a hundred years later, only incremental progress had been made. It was in 1963 that the great Dr. Martin Luther King in his most off-quoted speech reminds us that the architects of our republic wrote in the magnificent Declaration of Independence, and they signed the promissory note that which ev so that every American was supposed to fall heir, that all would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
But you know, King had to lament that America had defaulted on this promissory note for her citizens of color, that is. It was a bad check that came back marked insufficient funds. And so people of color still don't have the same access today as some of their Anglo counterparts. They don't have access to the same health care and education. No access to the same jobs because the systems that were put in place did not level the playing field. And you know today, even if you were to identify as a certain Envi as a certain sexual identification. If you were to say and identify yourself in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender community, it means living with daily discrimination. Every day, this community in some form or other experiences some way of being rejected and demeaned, some way of being looked down upon, all based on some narrative that somebody has conjured in their mind. And you know, it's not too far even from the church though. And I'm talking about the universal church, not necessarily this one. If you think about the way we define who's in and who's out, if you're below a certain age, well, then you're in. And if you're above, you're out. If you're thin and you can still make your fighting weight, you're in. But if you're above a certain BMI, you're out. If you matriculated at a certain university, have that degree, you're in. But if you have a GED, you're out. If you live in a certain neighborhood, you're in. But if you live on the other side of the tracks, you're out. If you attend a certain church and you have a certain type of ministry and function, you're in. But if you go to the church down the street, you're out. We use all kinds of arbitrary reasons, don't we, to disassociate ourselves from people that we don't think deserve God's attention, nor ours. In fact, some have even placed padlocks on pulpits to say who can be a spokeswoman or a spokesman for God. And when you face this type of discrimination day after day, a certain kind of pain like Daniel Black talks about in his novel, The Coming, where he recounts the Middle Passage journey from Africa to America's shores. And he says that there's some pain that dwells in wretched silence. It's called agony. It finds a resting place in the soul and takes up residence like it belongs there and it settles like some invisible disease. Family, Tony Campolo was a professor emeritus of sociology at Eastern University. He did uh, or does a ton of public speaking even today. His work takes him around the globe. And he talks about if you live on the East Coast, and if you were to travel to Hawaii, there's such a time differential that it makes three o'clock feel like it's really nine o'clock in the morning. On one such occasion, he had traveled to Honolulu, Hawaii. He found himself wide awake long before dawn. Not only was he up while everyone else was sleeping, he wanted to find something to eat. He wanted breakfast. Everything on the island was still closed. So he found himself in the wee hours of the morning wandering up and down the streets of Honolulu trying to find a place that he could grab a bite to eat. When on a side street, he found a little place that was still open. He took a seat on one of the stools at the counter and waited to be served. He described this place as a real dive. It was a greasy spoon. He didn't even want to touch the menu for fear something might crawl out from under it. <laughs> he says there was a chubby guy behind the counter that asked him, hey, what do you want? Campolo told him, I want a cup of coffee and a donut. The guy poured the cup of coffee and wiped his grimy hand on the smudged apron. He grabbed a donut off the shelf behind him and put it on his plate. Campolo sat there eating his donut and sipping his coffee 
when the door of the diner flew open. And to his discomfort, in marched eight or nine provocatively and boisterous prostitutes. Since it was a small place, they sat on either side of him. They talked loud, they were crude. Campolo began feeling out of place and he was looking to make a getaway. He overheard the woman sitting beside him say, you know, tomorrow's my birthday. I'm going to be 39. Her friend responded in a nasty tone, so wh what do you want from me, huh? The woman says, come on, um, I, don't, I don't want anything. I was just telling you it was my birthday. I mean, no one ever's done anything for me my whole life. So why should I expect anything now? They brush past her comments and the lady's gone talking deep into the night. It's difficult family, isn't it? When you think someone knows who you are, but they don't really know you at all. When you feel like no one is hearing you. And you know, there is our friend Cornelius too. He was God-fearing, but he's serving a God that he feels doesn't really know him. And he's feeling a bond to the Israelite people that don't really understand him. When all of a sudden, in mid-afternoon prayer, an angel breaks in and calls his name, Cornelius. What is it, sir? Afraid like most of us would be. And the angel says to him, your prayers and your generous gifts to the poor have ascended as a memorial before God. And that's good news for you and me, church. Because if you, like me, have ever felt forgotten, that is good news. I mean, it's hard to appreciate in the English version, but the way that the Greek text renders it, it's the odor, it's the fragrance of Cornelius' prayers and his work that have risen to the nostrils of God. It's in such a way that when God smells Cornelius' prayers. He remembers the person and the work that sent them. And God doesn't have selective amnesia, not like frail and fickle humanity. So while you and me, we might feel like our prayers and work have been forgotten, our acts of service have been received at heaven. Reminds you a little bit of Matthew's gospel, doesn't it? Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad because great is your reward at heaven. So church, that's why we don't grow weary in well do in well-doing, because in good time, we will reap a harvest. And then the angel says to Cornelius, what I need you to do is send men from Caesarea to Joppa. I want you to get a certain Simon. He's at a tanner's house named Simon. And so then God has a little talk with Peter. And he visits Peter. And when Peter is praying, he sees heaven open and a large sheet descends and it's lowered to the ground with four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals and birds of the air. And then Peter hears a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice tells him again a second time, what God has made clean, Peter, you must not call profane. This happened three times and then the thing will suddenly take up into heaven. And sometimes I look at Peter and I think of him having a mind like Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln one time said, you know, I have a mind like steel that it takes a lot to get something etched on it, but once it's there, it never leaves me. You can remember that when Peter had denied Jesus three times, Jesus reinstated him thrice, didn't he? Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Well, feed my lambs. Second time, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Tend my sheep. 
Peter, do you love me? By that time, Peter was upset and hurt, right? Lord, you know I love you. Okay, well, feed my sheep. So now he breaks in on Peter and tells him another thing three times. But now God breaks in on Peter to remind him, you know what, Pete? You don't serve a tame God. You don't serve a God that you have fully figured out. No, Peter, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. For as high as the heavens are from the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You, Peter, don't get to dictate to me what is acceptable and what isn't. No, I have declared what's clean and what is not. And now what I need you to do is to go to Caesarea, because there's some people People waiting on you. So the next day he gets to Caesarea and the men that were with him accompanied him from Joppa. They came to Caesarea and Cornelius is expecting them and he called together his relatives and his closest friends. But you know what? The more I read about old Cornelius, the more I like him, don't you? I mean, God didn't have to tell Cornelius to do anything three times. He told him once and he did everything. And so much so now, Cornelius is at his house in a place of expectation. He expected God to make good on God's promise. So he goes to get his friends. He gets them in position to receive what God has for himself and for them. You know, church, that, that is the kind of church. That is the kind of Christianity. Those are the kind of Christians that we want to be. We want to be the kind that puts people in a posture to hear from the Lord. And so Peter says, now you, he gets there. Now you yourselves know that it's unlawful for me, a Jew, to visit you, a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. Now may I ask you, why have you sent for me? Cornelius recapitulates his side of the story. And then he says, now Pastor Peter, you're so kind for coming. And all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. And, you know, in a world where God has to contend with so many distractions, family, these are the words that I believe God wants to hear today. I mean, that's really the attitude we want to have when we come to the church. You know, I decided a long time ago, whether I'm preaching or not, I want to come to a church because I want to hear a word from the Lord. And then Pastor Peter opens up his beginning comments. I understand that God does not discriminate. But in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to the Almighty. My goodness, I think Peter's got it, don't you? I mean, my goodness, he's got it, doesn't he? Uh, but it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Is this experience, was it for Cornelius or was it for Peter? Which one is having this conversion experience? But Peter starts to preach, and I like Peter's preaching. You know, he starts to preach the peace through Jesus Christ, that Jesus is Lord, and that message spread throughout all Galilee. Oh, you remember, we're in the book of Acts, and we know Luke wrote Acts. So why don't we talk a little bit about Luke's gospel? Because it says that he preached with the content of the gospel. And so here we are. In Luke, he starts out at Jesus' baptism. And you remember the baptism um, where the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form, like a, in the form of a dove. And God says, opens the heavens. You are my son in whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved. But then if you can imagine Peter just walking down Luke's gospel, he comes to chapter 4 following that wilderness experience and Jesus was filled with the spirit and he returns to Galilee and an article had circulated from the Galilean Gazette traveling through and spread all about the region talking about this Jesus and when Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been raised he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and as you remember he stood up 
and he was handed the scroll from the prophet Isaiah, and it was given to him. He unrolls the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He has sent me to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolls up the scroll and hands it back to the attendant and tells them today that has been fulfilled in your hearing. But you know, then he goes on to Capernaum and starts to do exactly what he said he was going to do. He starts teaching in synagogues and he talks about, it tells about a demon who cried out when he meets a man who was possessed. Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? But Jesus rebukes this demon saying, be silent and come out of him. The demon convulses and throws him around, but ultimately it comes out of him without doing any harm. And the people were amazed and said, well, what kind of authority and power does he have with his words that he can command even the unclean spirits? Peter goes on, you know, but then Jesus came to my house and he saw my dear mother-in-law suffering with a high fever. And we had a little talk with Jesus and told him all about our problems. And he stood over her and he rebuked the fever. And do you know that thermometer dropped below 100 degrees? And my dear mother-in-law got up and started serving us. You know, that's a message for all of us, right? Some of us get healed and we go on about our business. But this mother, this dear mother-in-law was healed and she got up and started serving. I think that's what Jesus is all about. Once he heals you, it's time to serve. She becomes a kind of suffering servant, doesn't she? And then in chapter 5, he makes a leper's skin as smooth as a newborn. In chapter 6, he cures a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath to remind people that he was Lord of the Sabbath. In chapter 7, he raised the widows, the son of a widow, the only son of a widow. And he forgives a woman who can't stop kissing his feet. In chapter 8, he calms a storm that reminds us that God can bring peace in our most tumultuous circumstances. But you know, by chapter 28, it gets dark. You get betrayal. In chapter 22, Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives, and Peter was there with some of the other disciples. And a group is led by Judas, and they come to arrest Jesus, and they take him and lead him away. And they mock him and beat him and tell him to prophesy. They took him from Pilate to Herod back to Pilate. It was a terrible miscarriage of justice. And even after Pilate and Herod had found him not guilty, they kept crying out, crucify him. And so they led him to the place called the skull. And they crucified Jesus there. And he hung there in desolation and abandonment. And then about noon, the darkness came over the whole land. In fact, the sun refused to shine. The curtain of the temple was torn in two, and he breathed his last breath. But you know that after that, they came. Some men came, and they wrapped his body in a linen cloth. And they laid it in a rock-hewn tomb. And some of our women came early Sunday morning with their spices and ointment to cover the body. But when they went in early Sunday morning on early dawn, the tomb, the rock had been rolled away from the tomb. They went in and they did not find the body. But then suddenly, two men were standing beside these ladies. And they asked them a question, why do you look for the living among the dead? But then scripture tells us in Acts that while Peter was still preaching, because that's enough to make you shout right there. But while Peter was still preaching, the spirit shows up. We're in Acts, right? The so spirit is poured out on this group. And Cornelius and his Gentile guests start speaking in tongues. Then his companions say, hold on, wait a minute. Um, we, we've seen this paranormal activity before. This reminds us of Acts 2. 
After Peter, Peter might be thinking, you know what? That is right. We were all there. It was 50 days after Passover. Jesus had already ascended and a sound came from heaven. It sounded like a rushing mighty wind and the spirit falls. And while they were all there, they in Jerusalem started speaking a, a tongue that they didn't learn at the University of Jerusalem. But everyone there, the Parthians and the Medes and the Elamites, they all heard us declaring the mighty deeds of God. Yes, Peter says, you know what? I recall that. In fact, I was caught up in my own oratory. I started quoting from the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. All flesh, all flesh, women, all flesh, boys, all flesh, yes, all flesh and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days and you know what they shall prophesy and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved and now Peter has to say you know what this same spirit is moving it was moving in Jerusalem but now we're in Caesarea we're at a Gentile's house. This ain't supposed to happen, but the spirit is doing something new and something similar at the same time. And Peter says, God has given the Gentiles the same gift given unto us. Can I withstand God? That's a great question. It's a rhetorical question, isn't it? Can I hinder God? Can anyone forbid water that these Gentiles be baptized? And you know what, family? I love this contemplative question that Pastor Peter asked. It's a question that we should ask ourselves, shouldn't we, from time to time. When we sense God moving in our lives, who am I to try to quell the work of God? To stop what God is doing in my own life. If God has ordained it by God's spirit, we should do it. If God has told you to step out on faith, faith. <laughs> and pursue your God-given calling, we should do it with all the strength and conviction and by the spirit that we can muster. Dr. Martin Luther King once said, if a man was called to, street, to be a street sweeper, he should sweep the streets, even as Michelangelo painted, as Beethoven composed music, as Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep the street so well that all the hosts of heaven have to pause and say, there lived a great street sweeper. But you know, there's another question that is asked that we should ask of the church. On one hand, we need to ask ourselves that question. Can I hinder God in my own life? But we also as a church need to ask God, should I hinder God in the church. And you know, sometimes the church can get in the way. Who is it that the church should stand in the way of what God is doing? Who is it that we should stand in judgment of our Lord? We should take the position and the posture of Cornelius, expecting God to do something so generous, so merciful, so otherworldly, and so utterly good. You know, church, I'm done with the sermon, but Tony Campolo, he was sitting at that diner in Hawaii listening to the conversation without even being noticed. And Campolo said when he heard what he heard, he made a decision. He sat and waited until all the women had left. He called over the guy behind the counter, and by now he learned his name was Harry. He says, hey, do these women come in here every night? Yeah, they do, he answered. The one right next to me, did, does she come in here every night? Yeah, he said, that, that's Agnes. Yeah, she comes in here every night. 
Why do you want to know? Because I heard her say that tomorrow was her birthday. Campolo says, what do you say we do something about that? What do you think about us throwing her a birthday party right here tomorrow night? The attendant says, I like that idea. He calls his wife. This guy's got a great idea. They want to throw a birthday party for Agnes right here. His wife comes out of the back room. Hey, that's a wonderful idea. You know, Agnes is one of those people that no one ever does anything nice for her. Campolo says, I'll get back here tomorrow around 2.30 and I will decorate. I'll even get the birthday cake. Harry says, no, wait a minute. The birthday cake is mine. Let me do the birthday cake. I specialize in birthday cakes. <laughs> so at 2.30 in the morning, Campolo was back at the diner. He had picked up some crepe paper decorations at the store and he made a sign out of big pieces of cardboard that said, happy birthday, Agnes. He decorated the diner from one end to the other. Harry's wife had gotten the word on the street because at 3.15, many of her friends had shown up. And then at 3.30 on the dot, the door of the diner swung open and everybody screamed out, happy birthday, Agnes. Never had they seen somebody so flabbergasted, so stunned and so shaken. In fact, she had to be led to a stool to sit down as they sang happy birthday to her. Agnes's eyes began to moisten. And when the birthday cake was brought out with the candles, she lost it. The floodgates opened, Harry muffled. Hey, uh, blow out the candles, Agnes. After an endless few seconds, she did. Then Harry handed her the knife and told her to cut the cake. But Agnes looks down at the cake. Without taking her eyes off of it, she, she slowly said, hey, look, Harry, is it, is it, is it okay if, if I kind of keep the cake for a little while? Harry's done, says, well, you know, that, that, that's fine, Agnes. <laughs> if you want to take the cake home, you, you, you can take the cake home. Um, it's okay. And so she looked at Campolo. He, too, said it was okay. Um, I live right down the street, just a few blocks. I'll be right back. I promise. I just want to take the cake and take it home. And so she got off the stool picked up the cake. Campolo says she carried it like the Holy Grail. Um, and she walked out toward the door. And everybody that was left in there trying to celebrate her birthday party was stunned and motionless, didn't know what to do. When the door closed, not knowing what else to do, Tony Campolo says he broke the silence saying, what do you say we pray? He said it felt like the right thing to do. And he prays for Agnes. He prays for her salvation. He prays for her life, that it would be changed. He prays that God would be good to her. When Campolo finishes his prayer, Harry leans over the counter with a trace of hostility in his voice. He says, hey, you never told me you were a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to? In one of those moments when just the right words came, Campolo says, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for street walkers. Harry waited for a moment. He said, no, you don't. There's no church like that. If there was, I'd join it. I'd join a church like that. Family, wouldn't we all love to be a church like that? After all, isn't that the church that Jesus died to save? Isn't it the message that we get at Cornelius' house? To God be the glory for the great things the Almighty has done. God bless you.